Oh God, I pray that we please you by remembering your son. We are so grateful for the blood of Jesus tonight who has washed us clean. Everything we've done, all the things that only you know about, Thank you that the blood is so powerful that we are washed clean. We are white, whiter than snow, all because of you. You're a good, good father. There is none like you. Praise you, King Jesus. We praise you, King Jesus. We have gathered here tonight just to praise you and bless you and tell you how grateful we are for you, amazed that you want to commune with us. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. Just real quick, if any of you have kids that are between like two and six, uh, you can head to the back if you want someone else to watch them for, for a bit. I mean, they're, you can follow Rob over there. But, um, I'm just so grateful that we get to partake in something so sacred. The body and blood of Christ, like the second member of the Trinity, and we are communing with him and we're remembering his body and blood. And like I said, when we started, like the goal of tonight is for God to look down and see a group of people that seriously believe in him and are actually excited to commune with him. I mean, he commanded us 2,000 years ago to do this in remembrance of, of him. And so as he looks down from heaven in this room, I want him to see like people who, who see that, that, just the honor of going, God, what an honor to remember your son. I want to remember him every day. I rem remember his sacrifice on that cross the body and the blood. Everything else in life is secondary to what we just did. I hope that we become a church that when we hear communion is going to take place, something in our heart leaps. You know? That we're living in a time where People get so excited about a, a certain speaker or a certain worship band. And when you hear, oh, they're going to be at this place, suddenly there's an excitement. And there's just something that is um, very wrong about that. Because we're, we're not excited about communing with the body and blood of Jesus. Um, there's something off in that. And as I was praying during communion, I'm just asking God for his forgiveness. And it's a joy to know that I have it. But I, uh, I don't know, one of the songs, one of the words, I don't remember what it was, but it was something about, you know, the, the glory, just giving the glory to him and, and just realizing that I've made a lot of mistakes in ministry. Um, a lot of times I would get ready to teach and I would be so excited about some insight I had or some illustration I was going to give or some story I was going to tell. And God's been convicting me of that lately. 
because in um, Isaiah chapter 66, verses 1 and 2, it says, Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me and what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made, and so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I will look, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. God in heaven says this is the one that I'm going to look to. The one who's humble and contrite in spirit and who trembles at my word. There's something about the word of God. Tonight, I want to talk about us becoming a church that trembles at the word of God. We tremble at the word of God. I'm praying, God, can you make our church a church that trembles whenever your word is spoken? You know, my daughter Mercy was pointing out a verse to me this morning, and in Ezekiel 44, it's talking about the priests, the Levites, and it says in verse 23, they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the common. He says, the job of the priest is to teach people the difference between something that is common and something that is holy. So some of you guys know, in the temple, they would have like cups and, and, and plates that were holy. They, these were holy utensils. You didn't take them home and eat off of them. You didn't use them for, for common use. It's like, like you need to understand certain things are reserved. This, this is something we've lost in our culture, the idea of something being sacred, something being holy. That's why, you guys, it kind of, it, it does blow my mind, and I praise God that he brought us to this specific church building, okay? There's a uniqueness to this. I mean, it's a weird story where, you know, Rob and I ran into a lady at an event, and she says, hey, can you pray for the church? And it happened to be this church, and, and then Lisa and I came to this, this church, and then we built a relationship with some of the people here, and then we're like, hey, can we use this on, on Friday night? And, and they've graciously, you know, worked it out so we can worship here. But there's something so special about this. I mean, I believe this is the oldest church building um, oldest church in EPA, but what blew me away was this and this. I was like, wow, the pulpit's off to the side, and communion is in the center, and the Word of God is in the center. Those who have been with me for a few years, you've heard me talk about that. Like, gosh, did you guys know? You know, and I would get so fired up. I go, they used to have communion at the center of the church. It was always at the center. Everyone was focused on Jesus. Communion should be at the center. And it was only 500 years ago that someone moved the pulpit and said, I'm going to put this in the center and let's move communion off to the side or even to the back or let's not even celebrate it for, you know, maybe once a month. Whereas it was never like that. It was always at the center of their gatherings. The body and blood of Jesus. If some of you remember, I started preaching from the side, and I would just put communion at the center. And then for God to bring us here, at a place where it's set up, to where, like that, that verse in Ezekiel, we want to differentiate what is holy and what is common what is sacred, and what is not. For me to stand in the middle 
and want the center of attention, which I fought that in teaching, versus saying no. This is why we come. And then for the word of God to be central. See, this is what I want. I, God made it very clear to me that my job in this season of life is to exalt his word. To make people understand that this book is holy. And I want us to be a church where if I'm talking like this, you know, you pay attention. But then when I come back here and I actually open the words of God, there should be a reaction in you. Where do you go? Okay, he's reading God's words now. Now is the time to tremble. Now is the time. This is not, we've been listening to human thoughts, insights, ideas. Some of you college students are like, oh, I listen to a professor with four PhDs. Wow. Okay, it's not that big a deal with people. But then comes the holy. Listen to what God says. And we read from this book. And this is different. Because the Bible says, Hebrews 4.12, that the word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. So these words are actually living. And this is what I was repenting of. There were times when I was just excited to share my insight. I was more excited about what I had to say than from reading in that book. I even remember, and this, this, is, this is what bothers me, back when I was in my 20s and I first started teaching, I remember a pastor told me, they go, you know, Francis, it, it seems like you'll read a verse, but you'll read it really quickly so that you can get to your story. So you can get to your, sometimes you don't even finish the verse. You see, when I was growing up, there was, a, there was a phrase where they were teaching us when we were preaching, and they said, you know, it is a sin to bore people with the Word of God. It's a, you know, so, so it was like this pressure on us as teachers, like, hey, it's a sin for you to bore people with the Word of God. And so in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, I don't want to do that. I want to make sure everyone is focused. You know, if anyone's not paying attention in the back, I, you know, I'm trying to grab their attention. I don't want to bore them. You guys still watching me? You still with me? I, you know, I'd bring out props. I juggle. I do whatever. I got to keep their attention. Got to keep their attention. And, and, and so, so this is what preachers did back then. We started, like, trying to get better and better and better at keeping people's attention. And so when we read the word of God, honestly, when I started, I thought, okay, I better do this fast because people have a short attention span. So I was like, okay, this, this is the Lord. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Okay, so think about, you know, and I would just start getting into these insights because I must treat the word of God as boring and as though my words were alive. And I'm, I'm just there confessing to the Lord, God, I, I want your words to be sacred. Forgive us for taking the holy things and treating them as common and then taking the common things and treating them like they're sacred. So I want to read a passage of scripture. 
So this is different. We're about to read from the Word of God. In fact, I'm just going to do something just to make my point. Can you and Pete, um, can you put that ladder up here? Can you just set it up here? Just face it. Just face it this way. There you go. I want to separate what's sacred. These are the words of God. The God who is keeping us all alive right now. The God who spoke the world into existence. And so when he speaks, we need to listen to it differently than everything else. These are the words of God. It's not a sin to bore people with the word of God. It is a sin for you to be bored with the word of God. Matthew chapter 7. I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 17. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun. And his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. What if you went up to a mountaintop and Jesus was there and he starts shining like the sun and then the glory cloud shows up and you hear a voice from the glory cloud. Wouldn't every bit of you just shake in fear wouldn't you just collapse I, I just can't imagine being able to stand through that I would just fall like the disciples did and be terrified 
because I'm hearing the voice of God. What do we believe about this book? Are these the words of God? So we need to learn to treat these words as sacred and differentiate them from everything else on this earth that's common. You can put that down. God says, Psalm 138, I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. You have exalted above all things your name and your word. God has exalted above all things his name and his word. God, if God exalts his word above all things, what should we do with his word as human beings? Picture God on his throne. What does he want to see in this room? Does he want to see people who when his word is read, they exalt that? over their own opinions, their own insights. And I, again, I just want to apologize just for the pride in my life, the doubt, where I would doubt the word of God was living and active, but I actually thought that it would bore people rather than believing there's a power in his word and it's actually living and it actually would do something to you. But I want to try to structure our gatherings almost like the book of Job. If you look at the book of Job, it's pretty interesting because, you know, in the beginning it talks about that interesting conversation that God and Satan have about Job and God tests Job and now suddenly Job loses his family his kids are are dead he loses everything that he owns he's left with nothing and then his body is full of sores and he's just starts to go what is this about I've lived a pretty righteous life and then his, his friends start questioning and saying, well, maybe it's this, maybe it's this, maybe it's this. And so for like 35 chapters, you've got Bildad and uh, Elihu and, and Eliphaz, and, and they're, they're like saying, well, it's probably this, it's, probably, it's just talking. And then Job talks. And then another guy talks, then Job talks, and, and they're just talking. Like, maybe it's this, maybe it's this, maybe it's this. But then comes chapter 38. Every time I read through the book of Job, I can't wait to get to chapter 38. 
Because in chapter 38, God speaks, right? And suddenly it's like, okay, all these guys are talking, all these guys were talking, all this noise, you know, some of it was true, some of it was off. At the end you realize they were, they were off and God was not happy with them. But it says in chapter 8 that God answers Job out of the whirlwind. Like a tornado. Picture a tornado. And a voice coming out of a tornado. And he says, brace yourself. Brace yourself like a man. I'm about to question you and you're going to answer me. It is so intense. Can you imagine if you were whining about your life? Well, this is so hard. Well, this is so hard. And then a tornado shows up and says, brace yourself. You're questioning me. I'm going to question you. And God speaks. And Job's response is, I'd always heard of you, but now that I've seen you, I'm just going to repent. Like there was just something about God's word. When God speaks, you got Peter, James, and John, they fall on their faces. When God speaks, Job and his friends are just silent. I would love to see us bring this back to the church where when we read from this book, we treat it as holy. These are not ordinary words. And we want to show God in heaven that we believe that. So, for the last half of my message, I'm just going to have Lisa read from Scripture the living word. And I believe this is going to affect us more than anything I could say. That we can trust communion and the word of God. Do you want to read from here, Lisa? Because it's the Bible. You want this? It's bigger. So we're just going to read from Job 38 all the way to the end of the book. And let's be a church that is not disappointed that we're going to listen to five chapters of the Bible, um, but actually that we get excited. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I was speaking in Florida and it was like 2,000 young people in a tent. And I've been so convicted about the word of God that I thought, oh, my gosh, these guys flew me all the way to Florida. And I'm going to get up there and I'm going to read like seven chapters from the Bible. <laughs> you know, to where they're looking at me like, hey, we could have done that ourselves. And I'm like, that's my point. Like, we have the word of God and these kids were going nuts over the word of god and i believe that this could be a season where the church in america repents for treating the word of god as common and treating common people as sacred and that we can turn it back and that, that would honor the lord so let's just enjoy hearing the word of god Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? 
on what were its bases sunk or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb, when I made clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band, and prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors and said, Thus far shall you come and no farther, and here shall your proud waves be stayed. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place? that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? It is changed like clay under the seal, and its features stand out like a garment. From the wicked their light is withheld, and their uplifted arm is broken. Have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you, or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare if you know all this. Where is the way to the dwelling of light? And where is the place of darkness that you may take it to its territory and that you may discern the paths to its home? You know, for you were born then and the number of your days is great. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow, or have you seen the storehouses of the hail, which I have reserved for the time of trouble, for the day of battle and war? What is the way to the place where the light is distributed, or where the east wind is scattered upon the earth? Who has cleft a channel for the torrents of rain, and a way for the thunderbolt, to bring rain on a land where no man is, on the desert in which there is no man? to satisfy the waste and desolate land and to make the ground sprout with grass. Has the rain a father? Or who has begotten the drops of dew? From whose womb did the ice come forth? And who has given birth to the frost of heaven? The waters become hard like stone and the face of the deep is frozen. Can you bind the chains? of the Pleiades, or loose the cords of Orion? Can you lead forth the Maseroth in their season? Or can you guide the bear with its children? Do you know the ordinances of the heavens? Can you establish their rule on the earth? Can you lift up your voice to the clouds that a flood of waters may cover you? Can you send forth lightnings that they may go and say to you, here we are? Who has put wisdom in the inward parts or given understanding to the mind? Who can number the clouds by wisdom? Or who can tilt the water skins of the heavens when the dust runs into a mass and the clouds stick fast together? Can you hunt the prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in their thicket? Who provides for the raven its prey when its young ones cry to God for help and wander about for lack of food? Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Do you observe the calving of the does? Can you number the months that they fulfill? And do you know the time when they give birth, when they crouch, bring forth their offspring, and are delivered of their young? Their young ones become strong. They grow up in the open, and they go out and do not return to them. Who has let the wild donkey go free? Who has loosed the bonds of the swift donkey to whom I have given the arid plain for his home and the salt land for his dwelling place? He scorns the tumult of the city. He hears not the shouts of the driver. He ranges the mountains as his pasture and he searches after every green thing. Is the wild ox willing to serve you? Will he spend the night at your manger? Can you bind him in the furrow with ropes, or will he harrow the valleys after you? Will you depend on him because his strength is great, and will you leave to him your labor? Do you have faith in him that he will return your grain and gather it to your threshing floor? The wings of the ostrich wave proudly, but are they pinions and plumage of love? For she leaves her eggs to the earth and lets them be warmed on the ground, forgetting that a foot may crush them and that the wild beast may trample them. She deals cruelly with her young as if they were not hers. Though her labor be in vain, 
Yet she has no fear, because God has made her forget wisdom and given her no share in understanding. When she rouses herself to flee, she laughs at the horse and his rider. Do you give the horse his might? Do you clothe his neck with a mane? Do you make him leap like the locust? His majestic snorting is terrifying. He paws in the valley and exults in his strength. He goes out to meet the weapons. He laughs at fear and is not dismayed. He does not turn back from the sword. Upon him rattle the quiver, the flashing spear, and the javelin. With fierceness and rage, he swallows the ground. He cannot stand still at the sound of the trumpet. When the trumpet sounds, he says, Aha! He smells the battle from afar, the thunder of the captains and the shouting. Is it by your understanding that the hawk soars and spreads his wings toward the south? Is it at your command that the eagle mounts up and makes his nest on high? On the rock he dwells and makes his home, on the rocky crag and stronghold. From there he spies out the prey, his eyes behold it from far away. His young ones suck up blood, and where the slain are, there is he. And the Lord said to Job, Shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? He who argues with God, let him answer it. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once and I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no further. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Dress for action like a man. I will question you and you make it known to me. Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be in the right? Have you an arm like God, and can you thunder with a voice like his? Adorn yourself with majesty and dignity. Clothe yourself with glory and splendor. Pour out the overflowings of your anger and look on everyone who is proud and abase him. Look on everyone who is proud and bring him low and tread down the wicked where they stand. Hide them all in the dust together. Bind their faces in the world below. Then will I also acknowledge to you that your own right hand can save you. Behold, Behemoth, which I made as I made you. He eats grass like an ox. Behold his strength in his loins and his power in the muscles of his belly. He makes his tail stiff like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are knit together. His bones are tubes of bronze, his limbs like bars of iron. He is the first of the works of God. Let him who made him bring near his sword. For the mountains yield food for him where all the wild beasts play. Under the lotus plants he lies, in the shelter of the reeds and in the marsh. For his His shade, the lotus trees cover him. The willows of the brook surround him. Behold, if the river is turbulent, he is not frightened. He is confident, though Jordan rushes against his mouth. Can you take him by his eyes or pierce his nose with a snare? Can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook or press down his tongue with a cord? Can you put a rope in his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Will he make many pleas to you? Will he speak to you soft words? Will he make a covenant with you to take him for your servant forever? Will you play with him as with a bird? Or will you put him on a leash for your girls? Will traders bargain over him? Will they divide him up among the merchants? Can you fill his skin with harpoons or his head with fishing spears? Lay your hands on him. Remember the battle. You will not do it again. Behold, the hope of a man is false. He is laid low even at the sight of him. No one is so fierce that he dares to stir him up. Who then is he who can stand before me? Who has first given to me that I should repay him? Whatever is under the whole heaven is mine. I will not keep silence concerning his limbs or his mighty strength or his goodly frame. Who can strip off his outer garment? Who would come near him with a bridle? Who can open the doors of his face? 
Around his teeth is terror. His back is made of rows of shields, shut up closely as with a seal. One is so near to another that no air can come between them. They are joined one to another. They clasp each other and cannot be separated. His sneezings flash forth light, and his eyes are like the eyelids of the dawn. Out of his mouth go flaming torches, sparks of fire leap forth. Out of his nostrils comes forth smoke as from a boiling pot and burning rushes. His breath kindles coals, and a flame comes forth from his mouth. In his neck abides strength, and terror dances before him. The folds of his flesh stick together, firmly cast on him and immovable. His heart is hard as a stone, hard as the lower millstone. When he raises himself up, the mighty are afraid. At the crashing, they are beside themselves. Though the sword reaches him, it does not avail, nor the spear, the dart, or the javelin. He counts iron as straw and bronze as rotten wood. The arrow cannot make him flee. For him, sling stones are turned to stubble. Clubs are counted as stubble. He laughs at the rattle of javelins. His underparts are like sharp potsherds. He spreads himself like a threshing sledge on the mire. He makes the deep boil like a pot. He makes the sea like a pot of ointment. Behind him, he leaves a shining wake. One would think the deep to be white-haired. On earth, there is not his like, a creature without fear. He sees everything that is high. He is king over all the sons of pride. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My anger burns against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. Now therefore take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up a burnt offering for yourselves. And my servant Job shall pray for you, for I will accept his prayer not to deal with you according to your folly. For you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuhite and Zophar the Naamathite went and did what the Lord had told them. And the Lord accepted Job's prayer. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before and ate bread with him in his house. And they showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a ring of gold. And the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. He had also seven sons and three daughters, and he called the name of his first daughter Jemima, and the name of the second Keziah, and the name of the third Karen Haput. And in all the land there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters. And their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. And after this, Job lived 140 years and saw his sons and his sons' sons, four generations. And Job died an old man and full of days. This is the word of the Lord.
Father, forgive me. For thinking too highly of myself and my thoughts. For not treating your word as sacred. Forgive us, Lord, for ever seeing your word as boring. Thank you for your word. Thank you that we get to see what a powerful God you are. We have no right to question you. Please, Lord, help us. Help us to restore your word to its rightful place. To exalt your word like you have. Holy are you, God. Worthy are you. We exalt your name and your word because you do. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice, that we could be forgiven today for our lack of reverence towards you and all of our pride only because of the cross. Do we approach you boldly now, Lord? Thank you. Thank you for bringing us in this room tonight to hear your word. And we trust it will not return void. Thank you for your word that humbles us and excites us that our God is a mighty, all-powerful God. And we worship you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.